This is Casey McBride with the NationalCrimeSyndicate.com. Uh, before we start today's episode, I wanted to give a great big thank you to Craig Timmons and Alan Lindblom at the NationalCrimeSyndicate.com for uh, hooking me up with today's guest, who is none other than mob historian Scott M. Bernstein. How are you doing today, Scott? Good, man. Thanks for having me on. I'm a big fan of you the bet. website and uh, everything you guys do. Great, man. Thanks. We're we're happy to have you. Um, I guess before we get started here, uh, we uh, I mean. Let's get started here, and uh, why don't we start at the beginning? Kind of tell us a little bit about your background and what piqued your interest in this, you know, particular genre. Uh, well, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. That's where my home base is, and um, I have some family history in organized crime circles, um, Jewish, and uh, some of my uh, lineage traces back to the Purple Gang, which was the most iconic criminal group probably in the history of the city of Detroit, and uh, they were the Jewish mob during Prohibition, and they were founded and led by the four Bernstein brothers, who are my, uh, I believe they're my third or fourth cousins. They're my grandpa's, my great-grandpa's first cousins, um, and so I grew up with a lot of, uh, a lot of lore, I guess, um, you know, people telling stories and, and kind of knowing that I had this kind of dark um uh, you know, dark family history. And, uh, but a lot of people assume that that's where really my interest in this started and really wasn't. It was something that I knew that, you know, existed in my background and something that, you know, again, that I'd heard a lot of, uh, a lot of tales and a lot of, um, you know, I, I just, there's, there was so much there, there's there, the, the, the purple gang has such a rich textured legacy that, uh, if you live in Detroit, you, you've heard about them. You've, you've, uh, had stories regaled to you about them. And so I kind of grew up with that knowing that I had that family connection to them, but it, it, it was, you know, something that, you know, I heard about and it was kind of interesting to me for, you know, the five or 10 minutes, someone was telling me a story for my family, but nothing that really went past that. And then, uh, fast forward to when I was in my early to mid twenties and I was in law school in Chicago and I went to work uh, in law school for the Illinois attorney general's office. And I worked in uh, the criminal prosecution uh, department and I worked uh, organized crime cases. And that is what really piqued my interest in the subject matter. Uh, I actually worked mob cases uh, from, from the Chicago outfit as a, you know, as an intern uh, in law school. I was 23, 24 years old and getting to actually work with Cook County Sheriff's Departments and, and liaisons from the FBI and ATF and DEA and uh, really was in on uh, the, the meat and potatoes of, of some, some big uh, mob and corruption uh, conspiracy cases of the early 2000s, mid 2000s, uh, from the Chicago mafia. And that really sparked my interest and, and got me wanting to read about both the people that I was uh, tracking and helping, uh, build cases against in my intern capacity, as well as wanting to learn about more about my family history and put it more in context. And I wanted to learn more about the Purple Gang and more about the Bernstein brothers, and then learn more about um, the history of the Detroit Mafia and the history of uh, organized crime factions and other areas of the country that I was um, tied into through family members and, and work and, and stuff like that. So I, you know, I think it was the summer of 2002 or three, and uh, I started to just read everything I could get my hands on, and it was kind of like, you know, what, what I guess the, the equivalent of now with it, you know, called binge watching on television. I kind of uh, binge read in the library and in, in the bookstores, just went and grabbed everything I could find on, on that had been written on, on organized crime, and I just kind of came to the conclusion with the help of one of my professors in law school that I wanted to write about it for a living. And uh, I was lucky. I had a professor that helped me get my um, my first book deal, which when I was only 28 years old. And I was also lucky that for such a storied history that the Detroit Underworld has, there wasn't a ton written about it. Um, so I was lucky to be able to get my first book off the ground at a pretty young age coming into a, 
uh, area that had been kind of barren in terms of a ton of more recent writings and researchings. And uh, I was also lucky that I had a series of true crime authors, uh, investigative journalists, historians that I looked up to from all my all my reading at that time period when I started to read all the, all the books I could get my hands on and I, and I developed some favorite authors of mine and favorite historians of mine, I made a list. And I remember sitting in my apartment in Chicago and just one couple over a couple of days, just calling them all up, just totally just cold calls, you know, just, Hey, my name's Scott Bernstein. I want to do what you do. I'm in law school. Um, you know, my goal is to be what you are, but, in the Midwest or in Detroit or in Chicago. And, uh, I was lucky enough. I had some, some guys like that, that I really admired that took me under their wing. Most notably George Anastasia, who is the, one of the, uh, America's leading true crime journalists and it's based out of Philadelphia, New Jersey. And, uh, a lot of his writing on the, on the Philadelphia mafia, the Bruno Scarfo crime families, um, was really transformational for me just to see, how you could tell a story um, so and and depict, depict these characters so vividly and tell a story, tell, tell, tell a story of history and crime. But it's, even though it's, it's a, it's nonfiction, it reads like fiction. And I really admired that. And he was someone that, that was really, you know, some people, you know, kind of blew me off. And, you know, if you call 30 people, you know, you're going to get a, a very, uh, amount of reactions. Most of them were, were very embracing, some even more embracing than others. And George was the most embracing. And I kept the, uh, kept a communication with him through, through law school. And then when I got out of law school and got my book deal, he, um, kind of meant, he, he mentored me and got me to my, uh, first literary agent. And, uh, the rest is history. I'm about, uh, 11 years into my career and have, uh, had five books published and been a, uh, featured, expert talking head on, you know, dozens of uh, national and local television and radio shows and just really love what I do. Yeah, it sounds like you, that's kind of a perfect storm. You're like the, the right person in the right job. And you also were surrounded by the right people to kind of, like you said, mentor you and take you under their wing and, and show you where to go. But say the you know, job you had, that's got to be great too, because it's giving you the research skills um, and just, you know, connections to, to make a book, like the kind of books that you do. Uh, that's, that's perfect. Yeah. And another kind of perfect storm aspect of it is that the, the amount of resources that traditional news outlets have been putting into mob writing have been cut back. So it allows for people like me to kind of come in and try to fill the void. Um, and that, that's what I'm trying to do with, with the website. My, my web magazine that I started uh, in 2014 called The Gangster Report, gangsterreport.com. And I try to focus on you know, four main areas and uh, get a lot of help. Uh, Detroit and Chicago, which are my bread and butter in the Midwest. And then because of uh, George Anastasia, I've been able to expand in, into Philadelphia where they've had a ton of cutbacks in their coverage um, for their both for their newspaper coverage and their television coverage, and if anyone is listening and knows the Philadelphia landscape, they 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 follow the Philly mob uh, like it's the Philadelphia Phillies or the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, the people in Philadelphia, <laughs> those you know, they uh, the, the the city is very cognizant of 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 the organized crime family there and, and the mob figures that have been running the city for a long time. They're they're fixtures or they have been fixtures on television and, 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 and newspaper headlines. And there's been kind of a void the last five, six years that I've been able to, with, with George's help and with the help of guys like Dave Schratweiser and some members of law enforcement, Dave Schratweiser as an investigative reporter on, on Fox Philly 29 in, in, in Chicago, or sorry, in Philadelphia. And they've helped me come in and, and help, help cover that base. And then I have family ties in New England. So I've been able to also through some of my, my family connections have uh, been able to go into the New England, Boston, Providence area and cover some stuff o- over there where, again, the, the, the resources that their media outlets have kind of been cut, which has allowed me to, to come in and, and uh, you know, cover some stuff that maybe I would, you know, probably wouldn't be able to, to gain any traction covering, you know, a decade ago or 20 years ago. So, uh, 
yeah, it's exciting. And it's, uh, in some ways, you know, we're, we're, we're at a different, you know, different time period for, for organized crime, but, you know, in some ways since 9-11, they've been forgotten about because of the priority shifts with federal law enforcement. So in some ways, you know, these mob figures that people kind of had thought were dead and gone because of a series of uh, federal prosecutions in the 80s and 90s, which really brought the golden age of the mob to its to its knees, um, had been able to resuscitate in the shadows because of, uh, like I said, priority shifts in in in, in the way that they're uh, tracked by law enforcement. So it, it, it bodes well for a journalist like myself. And I would say that uh, my you know crowning achievement as an author, my 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 most beloved of my five books is a book I wrote on the Philadelphia Mafia that came out in 2012 called The Mafia Prince, which is about Crazy Phil Leonetti, who was the underboss and uh, nephew surrogate son of the maniacal uh, 1980s Philly godfather, uh, Nicodemo, little Nicky Scarfo. Nice. Yeah. It's, you know, I love the way that you kind of specialize in certain areas. I know a lot of kind of mob historians that they, they tend to try to take it all in and it's such a, a gigantic history and there's so much going on. It's just impossible to do that. So I think, you know, when you focus in on certain areas, especially ones that you have a connection to, or you're, you're making connections that, that are going to help you yeah. along the way, that's a, that's a smart way to do it. And with the Detroit connection, like you're saying, it, it's, it's kind of an untapped resource because everybody's always focusing on Chicago or New York. So that's yeah. great. And Detroit is, uh, is an anomaly in the sense that, and I would say that even though I, I, I'm proud of, of my research and my ability to understand the terrain in Chicago, Philly, and New England. Nothing really matches my uh, my ma- see my mastery of the subject in Detroit. And that, again, that's a lot of that's because of resources I've been able to develop, both um, current law enforcement, former law enforcement, guys on the street, and then obviously piggybacking off of a lot of research that had been done before me. Um, in you know, in the mid mid twentieth century, uh, which we all do. <laughs> yeah, that's the name of the game. You know, that's uh, been able great to, to have that there. Right. Yeah, but yeah, Detroit is an anomaly. There, a uh, family that that thrives um, under the radar and uh, lives by the lives by the mantra "Make money, not headlines." And they've been the picture of stability and profitability and longevity. Uh, for for every mafia family uh, in America, and uh, the fact that they they don't end up in jail, they don't end up dead on the street, um, is a, is a testament to kind of how these guys operate at a much higher level than than most mobsters and most mob families. And there's only been one member of the family to ever turn government informant. Um, the last made member of the mob in Detroit to be killed was in 1985. So. You're just talking about a, you know, violence is last resort, and business comes before everything, and uh, stability comes before everything. And the same names that were running the family uh, 80 years ago uh, are, are running the family today. So again, that speaks to the stability a- aspect of it. And one thing that that uh, is very unique in, in the Detroit family is that uh, the first generation uh, made uh, had an edict that the second generation had to, for the most part, all had to go get uh, college business degrees. So you'd be hard pressed to find one or two, three guys in any other family that that uh, that have that have college educations. And in Detroit, you know, you had the whole group of guys that took over from the first generation and, and took the family into the 21st century. Are all college educated with business degrees, accounting degrees, which is just, you know, has, has, has paid it forward for that family uh, tenfold and has allowed them to kind of vertically integrate into uh, white collar, uh, white collar society, white collar crime. And, and a lot of these guys that are dying off now, the second generation that are, they're in their eighties and, and are dying off in the last, let's say decade. Um, they don't die gangster rich. They die, boardroom rich <laughs> a guy with you know, a couple hundred thousand or even a million or two to his name we're talking about guys with tens of millions of dollars to their name and a lot of that money 
being legitimate money from from legitimate businesses that they were able to maybe they didn't maybe they didn't uh, uh, maybe they got their hooks into that business illegitimately, but once right. they got their hooks into it, they were able to turn it into legitimate sure. money. <laughs> now, being from the area, do you run into problems ever? You know, with your research and with your and your books, uh, is that ever a problem? For yeah. You? I mean, I I thought that uh, before I got into this, right when I was getting into the business, you know, just typical kind of uh, mythology, I guess you would say. I thought that, you know, the majority of the people I was writing about would have a problem with me and I would ha- I'd have to be ducking lawsuits all the time and, you know, work looking out for my personal safety. And, <laughs> and that's, that's really, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to. I don't want to negate that, that, you know, you definitely have to be careful and, and, you know, not print everything you hear. And you definitely have to be weary when you're interacting with, with people that are, you know, have, have criminal pedigrees. But I would say that to my surprise, like I said, almost a dozen years in right now, um, I've had very limited blowback. Now there are people that uh, don't love what I, you know, don't love what I do or don't love what I, uh, what I write about or go on television and, and talk about or go on the radio and talk about. And I've gotten, you know, a ham- you know maybe more than a handful of emails over the years or messages over the years uh, telling me, you know, why are you doing this? You know, uh, uh, I don't, I, you should be embarrassed about how much money you're making off of disparaging Italians or stuff like that. I, I have a quick go back for them. I mean, I'm like, I, I, I'm disparaging my own family when I write about some of this stuff. So <laughs> it's equal opportunity for me. Right. Uh, I had I had, a, I had a I had a woman who was the the daughter of a gangster show up at one of my book signings and make a scene. You know, my oh, my wow. grandkids had to learn about their grandfather through your book and stuff like that. But that again, that's kind of the exception of the rule. But what I found is. Uh, uh, <laughs> not that a lot of gangsters like what I write about, but a lot of gangsters are in Detroit are relatively okay with me being around to the point where, you know, some of them feed me information. So Sure. And if and they know who you are, so if they're going to feed you yeah. information, they, they know what they're doing at the time. And, you yeah. know, so, but um, yeah, you know, it, it is fascinating. There's, it's just got to be expected that if you're going to do something like this, you're going to have people that are first going to be just, critical of your facts and then other people that are just going to hate the whole idea of what you're doing. But it's, um, you know, it's history. It did happen. Um, and there's a huge audience for it. You know, people like me, I think perfect you, example. So I try to get it. I try to get face to face with as many of them as possible. And I think you, you fear or you fear what you don't understand or what you don't know. And when I get face to face with a lot of my, I feel like some of that, some of that mindset goes away. They, they know who I am. They know that I'm willing to interact with them and, and take what they tell me at the same value as I would take a, an FBI agent or, uh, you know, a, a police officer that they've, they've encountered. And, and I tell them, I just want to get, the, I just want to get the story straight. I just want to, you know, get, get down for the record, get down for the history books. What, you know, what, what, what actually happened here? And I'm 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 going to listen to you and give you the same weight as I'm going to give anyone else. And if I if I make a mistake, call me on it. Here's my number. Sure. You know, here's my email address. Tell me I made a mistake. Um, I'm 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 fallible. I've, I've made plenty of mistakes in my 12 years. And naturally, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, I I, I don't think uh, um, to the point where it undermines my work. But you know, I, I've misstated something here or there or, or misheard something here or there I know and, and I tell the story to them all the time when I kind of interact with sometimes with with wise guys and some of them are like you know you just you're a conduit for for the government you know you're just spewing what they say I, I try to explain to them I learned really quickly that you can't, even the government you can't take what they say you know you there, there's that middle ground with everything and I had an FBI agent that, and sometimes again, sometimes it's just it's just being human. I had a, an FBI agent that told me that um, this one gangster had been killed in a bar fight, or in a got shot in a bar fight and died. And uh, I ended up writing it, and uh, the guy didn't die. <laughs> he showed up somewhere where I was at and pulled out his driver's license and was like, "I don't know who told you I was dead, but." Wow, and, you know that that was that's like the ultimate lesson for me. That like this, I, at first, my first, you know, uh, when I first got on it, 
I thought like, well, the, what the FBI is telling me is the gospel, you know, is how could exactly. they be wrong? And this guy just misremembered. He's like, yeah, I was shot in that bar fight and I was in the hospital for four months, but I didn't die. That's hilarious. You know, I think it is, it's kind of a good lesson for you guys like us that are, you know, talking about this stuff and writing about it. Um, you know, I've had some real doozies too. And uh, I remember Christian Cipollini saying once, you know, he's like, mm-hmm. like no writers infallible. Like you have to be flexible. That's part of the history is, and you know, that's part of, kind of what we're doing. It's great when you can find something that people take as fact and then you can prove it wasn't. And, and, but you know, if anybody that thinks that they're not making mistakes or, you know, everything that they put out there is a hundred percent accurate, um, there's just no way that you can do it. So it's, it's a good lesson to have, you know, your first big doozy of a, of a, like something like that where you're like, Oh, well, I was like some egg on your face, but you know, Hey, (laughs) I got to correct, you know, I, you know, you, that's what that's what's great about um, journalism now. I mean, it, it, you know, a lot of things are online. You can just go on and edit it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. I was just say I also write crime for my newspaper. I work at the Oakland Press, which is a, a is the um, third daily in, in Detroit, underneath the Free Press and the News. So you know, I you know not just I don't I don't just write books. I write you know day to day stuff too. So right, there's always uh, always you know stuff cooking, and you gotta. Keep your finger on the pulse, and that's a whole new challenge too. Because you you're on deadlines, like every you know you have to yeah. produce, 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 and, and that's a, a completely different kind of writing than like for me, where I'm like I, I'm interested in the subject, and sometimes when I come home and I have a few hours and I'm not tired, I I write about it a little bit, but then the next day I you know might go out to dinner with my wife or something. But when you have to you know come up with something every day or every week on a deadline, that's a lot more pressure. It's a lot different. And mm-hmm. it's, I think you, the tendency is to, you know, you want to just have a story, you have less time to check your facts and get everything straight. So that's it. Yeah, know, especially in this day and age where 24 seven news cycle, you know, you got to keep on reminding yourself, you'd rather be right than, than first. Sure. That's true. That's a, that's a, that's a, a great, uh, a great point right there. Um, now I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about, uh, I don't know a lot about the Detroit history, but it, two of the guys that I've always kind of been interested in are the, is it the Jackaloni family, the Jackaloni brothers. Mm-hmm, the Jackaloni uh, brothers. Yep. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about those guys? I always kind of found them fascinating. Well, the Jackaloni brothers um, were the face of the Detroit mafia on the street for over half a century. Um, they are, in their own way, an anomaly amongst the family that's an anomaly. Uh, <laughs> The Detroit family, as uh, as uh, entity in, in in general terms, you have to be born into the family in order to rise. You have to have uh, another edict that the leaders, uh, the, the the founding the founding fathers, being Joe Zerilli and Black Bill Toko, uh, it's called the you know Toko Zerilli crime family. Um, they, those two were the founding fathers of the family and and led the family in one capacity or the other from 1931 into the late 1970s, and those guys made sure that you know everyone married off their daughters and their nieces and their nephews and their sons to other members uh, of the family and and also sometimes other members of other families to to consummate and strengthen uh, relationships across the country um the jackalones didn't come from any mob pedigree at all they were just a couple of street toughs that had grown up um in eastern market which is the uh, it's the mob hotbed on the east side of the city, um, and they were they were plucked plucked by the uh, by Zerilli and Toko at a young age and groomed. Um, they they came up bodyguards and um, chauffeurs for for uh, guys like Joe Zerilli, Black Bill Toko, um, their brother-in-law, a guy by the name of Machine Gun Pete Carrado, who was their street boss, and. They were groomed to be the day-to-day overseers. Um, Detroit is is huge on insulation, layers upon layers of insulation, and there's always been uh, uh, barriers between um, the administration and the the, uh, the white collar um, faction of the family and the blue collar faction of the family, and the Jackalones represented the blue collar faction of the family. And, and like I said, on a day-to-day basis, um, they spoke for Toko and Zerilli. And then when Toko and Zerilli 
passed away and gave over control of the family to their sons, the Jackaloni spoke for the second generation of, of Tokens, really. And it was a relationship that uh, it was a coexistence. Um, the Jackalones didn't love the fact that they weren't numero uno. Um, they didn't have the final say on everything, but on a day-to-day basis, they did. Um, they were given uh, pretty much they were autonomous on, on the day-to-day, uh, major policy decisions and uh, final sign-offs on. Uh, murders and stuff had to go up the chain of command, but on a day-to-day basis, they they ran the show, and they were that that appeased them. And uh, they, unlike the Toko uh, and Zerillis, who specifically Joe Zerilli, the longtime Don, and his successor, his nephew uh, Black Jack Toko, two guys that really shunned the spotlight and didn't want to be seen as gangsters or viewed as gangsters by the community. They wanted to be viewed as kind of benevolent community leaders. The Giacalone brothers reveled in in the, the knowledge of the general public that they were they, <laughs> was a, they were the iron fist of the mafia. Right. They, they got off on glaring at people and looking scary and dressing in fancy suits and running around in fancy cars with fancy women and dining at the fanciest restaurants. They, they liked all that. Um, and, you know, from a, from the point of view of the leadership, uh, the top leadership, they were fine with that. They provided a lightning rod. And that's, sure. why, told, that's why Tony Giacalone and Billy Giacalone, uh, between them, you know, probably had four dozen arrests, five dozen arrests. <laughs> and, and Billy Giacalone did more prison time than probably anybody, um, uh, you know, in the family history. But they, they, like, they were able to coexist and, and – uh, I think in a lot of other families, the dynamic was very similar to what was going on, at least in the, in the 70s and 80s. The dynamic was very similar to what was going on in the Gambinos with a much, um, much more successful result. <laughs> right. uh, Jack Toko, who took over from Joe Zarelli, who was like the equivalent of Carlo Gambino, he gave it over to his nephew, Jack Toko, who was very much like Paul Castellano. And Tony Giacalone, who was... The older, the older of the two brothers, uh, the, the two Jacqueline brothers are Anthony Tony Jack Jacqueline and Vito Billy Jack Jacqueline, right. and um, they they complemented each other. Tony was uh, they, they 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 knew how to play good cop bad cop. Tony was the bad cop. Billy was the good cop. Billy was the was the more jovial one that was more of the mob politician. Tony was the one that that uh, enjoyed striking fear in everybody, not just the public, but, but <laughs> yeah. his subordinates. And Tony Giacalone, more so than Billy, was John Guy, um, if, if making the comparison to, to Gambinos. And Tony Giacalone resented Jack Toko. Uh, as, he's a boardroom gangster. He's never got his hands dirty. Um, we're out here on the that, street, you know, the doing all the dirty work. And, and, yeah, but they were able to coexist. Uh, I, think there was, I think out of respect for for Jack Toko's uh, uh, father and uncle, uh, out of respect for the fact that his father and uncle were Tony and Billy's mentors, um, they weren't going to, you know, go into uh, DEFCON Death Death Con 5 or whatever, where you were going <laughs> to actually uh, 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 put together a, a pal's coup. Um, and they didn't like each other. They didn't socialize. These weren't Jack Toko and Tony Jagaloni and weren't guys that were going out and playing golf together or going on vacation together. Um, but Tony Jack would, you know, defer to, to Jack Toko, uh, like I said, for policy decisions and stuff like that. And Jack Toko basically unleashed the reins on the day-to-day basis, just like his, uh, Jack Toko, just like his uncle and, and, and father had done, um, and let Tony and Billy, you know, run the show um, on the street and, and didn't really get in their hair at all. So they were able to coexist, uh, even though they didn't like each other, just like uh, Jack Toko kind of, or just like Tony Jack kind of looked down at, or look, looked down at J- uh, Jack Toko as being a, you know, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, never got his hands dirty. He's a boardroom gangster. He's a racketeer. He's not a wise guy. Um, Jack Toko looked at Tony and Billy and said, you know, they're, these are, you know, they're junkyard dogs. They're, they're, they're not refined. They're not, even if they dress nicely, they're not refined men. They're not, they're not, uh, uh, you know, 
they're not guys that that could walk into a boardroom and be respected. Sure. Um, so it was kind of a mutual kind of disdain for each other. But like I said, a coexistence uh, based on the fact that uh, there had been this history of, of stability that wasn't going to be wasn't going to be shaken because of all the years uh, entrenched of that, that there weren't palace coups, there weren't um, there weren't shifts in leadership via violence. That just wasn't how it went. And uh, like I said, Billy and Tony played off each other. Um, they were best friends, and and you know they palled around together quite a bit. And Billy was, you know, even though he was a little brother, he had um, an equal amount of respect uh, that his big brother had. And uh, these were guys that, um, you know, when I use the term weren't af- weren't afraid to get their hands dirty, it would be an understatement. These are guys that were suspects and. I'd say well over 30 gangland murders, wow. um, possibly, you know, uh, reaching the, you know, 40 or 50, um, whether or not they were physically, um, carrying them out or ordering them done. Uh, these were the, the, uh, they, they, they headed the enforcement unit of the family from the 1940s all the way into the two thousands. And, and these were guys that were more than capable in terms of, uh, in terms of mob parlance. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. When you see that, there's a couple of famous pictures of of the brothers, and there's the one of Vito uh, when he's older, getting you know, it's his, getting booked. But you you you'd look at him in the picture at that that age, you'd never know. <laughs> he just looks like somebody's grandfather that you know. Got yeah, I've heard DUI some. Uh, you know, Billy had a uh, Billy had from a from a young age had uh, at a young age had gotten run over by a milk truck and lost his leg, and um, had a you know, had a peg leg like, oh, that, you, that. You, you, that you attached at the bottom of his right. <laughs> leg to give him a foot. And um, I've heard a, a number of stories at the end of, I'm sure this may, this might've happened earlier in Billy's life, but I heard more stories about, you know, Billy at the, the end when he was still a, a power, he was the underboss of the family um, throughout most of the two thousands um, that uh, people, uh, you know, younger guys would be driving him around in meetings and, Billy would be like, yeah, my leg's really hurting me, and, and literally detach, detach his leg in the middle of the car and just plop it on the <laughs> plop, plop it in the console. And uh, then when, wherever they got where they uh, – because I think he had some arthritic uh, issues or whatever, but he just hadn't – he didn't really have any shame. You know, he was just like, yeah, I got you know, to gotta detach my leg and, and make it feel better, and then when we get to the meeting that we're going to, I'll put it back on. And he actually got uh, – he got in trouble. His last Billy's last present uh, Billy's last prison sentence was uh, between '98 and '04. Um, he served it in Ashland, Kentucky, and uh, he got in trouble uh, for smuggling uh, cigars and other type of contraband in his in his peg leg. <laughs> that they they confiscated it. So for the last couple of years of the sentence, he had to be in a wheelchair. Oh no! Wow. So he was he was you know, he would take meetings with. Uh, his, his subordinates and underlings that would come visit him in Kentucky, they would, they would give him uh, under the table. They'd, they'd, they'd uh, hand over, you know, various, uh, you know, food and, like I said, uh, uh, you know, cigars, food, whatever, <laughs> right. and put them in his leg. That's, that's a great one. I had no idea that he, he was even missing his leg. So, wow. Everyone, Man. every you know, Billy was, like I said, Billy was was just as scary, uh, you know, if, if you got on his bad side, the Tony, but everyone loved Billy. Not everyone loved Tony. Billy wow. was, Billy was beloved. Uh, Tony was respected and feared. Yeah. Billy we always was, need one of those the, guys. The rare, Billy was the rare, Billy was the rare combination of uh, beloved, respected and feared. Yeah. It's, you know, it, all the successful, you know, partnerships, families, whatever you want to call them, uh, they all have the one sort of Frank Costello guy who's more like you're saying the boardroom guy, but then they always have the Vito Genovese. <laughs> you, know, there's, you need both of those things to kind of make it work. And But what, you know, you're telling us here about the Detroit, what's fascinating is that on paper, and if you're supposed to follow the rules, it should work great, but it never does because there's always, uh, you know, they're butting heads, and usually the the tough guys want to stage a coup or a coup, like you were saying. So the fact that they were able to keep that that uh, balance because, for so long, that's amazing. I think in a lot of families, in a lot of situations, that would have gotten out of hand, uh, the yeah. Jacklonies uh, and, and the Tocos in the in the 70s and 80s. But like I said, because Detroit was Detroit, it didn't. 
yeah, and everybody benefits, you know, if you, everybody could could just stay as a team and, and, and make it yeah. work, you know, everybody is actually one of, one of the, the Jackalones, um, if people are aware of the, the Jimmy, I'm sure people are aware of the Jimmy Hoffa mystery and the, you know, his disappearance and murder, which is one of the most, um, you know, uh, most talked about unsolved mysteries in, in American history and whatnot. And yeah. the Jackalones were, were the ones that were in charge of the whole thing, uh, putting it together and, and orchestrating it. And uh, the day that it, it occurred, it, Jimmy Hoffa disappeared and was probably killed around, let's say, between 2.45 and 3.15 on the afternoon of, of July 30th, 1975. And a very telling sign that, that things were amiss or that something unusual was happening that day was, um, well, first was the fact that Billy Jack had sh- had shook his tail, his, his normal surveillance unit. Um, couldn't account for him for that entire day. So that by itself uh, told you something. And then another thing that I've gotten from talking to FBI agents, surveillance unit, or guys that were on that surveillance unit, um, as well as combing over documents, the, uh, so this happened, uh, he was kidnapped around 2.45, was probably killed in the next half hour. At about 4.45, which would have been about an hour and a half after um, he was killed, uh, Jack Toko uh, was seen driving, uh, into the parking lot of Tony Giacalone's headquarters, which was called the South Athletic Club, and that was on the west side of town, and, and Jack Toko was an east sider. And uh, the fact that these two would be meeting um, was very rare. And the fact that Jack Toko, you know, when they did meet, it was the Giacalone's going from the west to the east. Uh, and the fact that Jack Toko uh, felt that the day was so uh, important enough to travel to Tony Giacalone. Um, that afternoon or that late afternoon um, really spoke volumes about uh, what was, um, you know, the the magnitude of what had happened. And right. uh, they were in a closed they were in a closed door meeting for about forty five minutes at the South Athletic Club, and uh, just not a not a normal occurrence that those two would be uh, meeting face to face on just a regular afternoon. Oh, to be a fly on the wall there. Deal yeah, right. What's going on in that room? Wow, man. I'm trying to, just so people uh, people don't know that Tony Giacalone was the guy that, that Jimmy Hoffa was going to meet uh, when he disappeared. Him and Tony Provenzano, they were supposed to have a lunch meeting about uh, four or five miles away from the South Athletic Club. And, uh, Jimmy Hoffa showed up. Giacalone and Provenzano didn't. And uh, uh, Sorry, Hoffa, sh- Hoffa showed up. Giacalone and Provenzano didn't. And... Uh, Hoffa disappeared from that meeting. Yeah, one of the biggest mysteries in our, you know, this crime history, yep. for sure. 43 years and counting this July, and it's uh, it's the case that will never die. And uh, for a family like Detroit, like I said, that really doesn't like being um, talked about on the news or written about on the newspaper, the fact that uh, this case has become like, uh, it's, just, it's a giant wild goose chase. Um, they're looking for a body that, in my opinion, doesn't exist. But if you live in Detroit, it becomes almost, or Metro Detroit, it becomes almost a rite of passage. Every couple of years, they do these digs, you know, based on sure. tips, looking for his remains. And you go to these things, and I've now covered a handful of them for my newspaper. Uh, it's like you're going to a football game. You got guys out there um, tailgating, <laughs> like barbecuing at, at the, uh, you know, bringing like a, a portable grill and barbecuing and <laughs> <laughs> having uh, you know, having a, a a portable radio there, and they they, they think that they're going to see the FBI pull out a body and, and take it and throw it into the meat locker, meat truck, right? Um, and it's just in some ways it's it's comical, in other ways it's tragic. But uh, I know that the uh, the powers that be in Detroit uh, almost resent the fact that they pulled off the perfect crime because they they still have to hear about it. Uh, Four decades later, and uh, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. <laughs> like, right, and one, but one, it still comes back to haunt you. Yeah, one prominent member of the family that that I had a relationship with um, told me that uh, in, in a in a <laughs> in a flash of frankness, he said, uh, "If we had to do it all over again, we just would have left them in the restaurant parking." And <laughs> just would have been done with. Sure. Right. Just would have killed. Yeah. Just would have killed him right where you know he's going to meet uh, Jack Loney Provenzano at this restaurant, and, and he was picked up in a car and taken away. It was actually Tony Jack Loney's son's car, which is the only piece of physical evidence ever recovered in the case. Wow. And uh, 
he was taken somewhere and, and executed. And this guy was like, if we had to do it all over again, we just would have popped him right on, right on, right in the parking lot and just let, you know, laid his body down there. And it would have been a big deal for, uh, right. you know, it would have been a deal at that point, but you know, in 2017, 2018, we wouldn't be talking about it anymore. Sure, right. The hindsight's 2020. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they thought they were, they were, like you said, pulling off the perfect crime. But who, who, who would know mm-hmm. that we would here? We would be still talking about it. Yeah, I watched one of the clips where you were on the news, and they had like the, the helicopter footage, and they're out there in the field, you know, yep. digging it up, and, <laughs> and uh, like, like you said, that's probably going to continue every couple of years. There's going to be one that's going to pop up. And, I'm telling you, it's 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 like, it's like clockwork. It's been a couple of years, and, and, and there hasn't been a Hoffa dig. You know, just wait a couple of months, and there will be one. Right. Well, it gives you it gives you something to write about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's great for me. No, it's great. Yeah. It's great for someone like me. For a fam- for a family that you know, writing about the Detroit family, it's it's you know, it's the opposite of Philadelphia. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Philadelphia, yeah. they uh, they revel in being gangsters, and they revel about being. Uh, on the news and in, in the newspaper to the point where the guys that have been running Philly for the last 25 years, they took over at a really young age. They took over in their thirties and they're now in their fifties. They all went to prison for about 10 years and they all came out in the last decade. And um, they've always been the cool kids. They've always been, you know, when they were in high school, they were the cool kids. And then when they were in their twenties, they were the up and coming uh, uh, good fellows and, uh, you know, hit the clubs and hit the bars and, Wherever they were was, was, was the place to be. Then when they were the 30s, they took over the family, and they were even uh, surrounding them was even more the place to be. And so when they came out of prison, and you know, let's say between 2009, 10, and now, what's cool now? Well, social media is cool. So they all they have all gravitated to Instagram <laughs> and Twitter and Facebook, and they're just all over the place on social media. It makes it e- very easy for someone like me who lives in the Midwest to keep track on uh, to keep tabs on these guys where they are. I mean, I can call guys in Philadelphia and be like, "Yeah, uh, you know, these two wise guys were at this so and so club last night." How do you know that? Well, they posted on their Instagram. Um, that's the exact opposite of Detroit, where they have very stringent rules, even you know, specifically against social media. Um, the underboss of the Detroit uh, mob has, has has told everyone uh, no no nobody posts pictures on social media and if anyone posts a picture of me on social media there's going to be hell to pay. Doesn't that just um, seem and, like a given? <laughs> like that should shouldn't right. even have to be said. You know? <laughs> like point your phone away. But Detroit is kind of a you know for their sake it's it's good when you're when you're a, a high profile mobster. Uh, or maybe that's an oxymoron. When you're a, when you're a, uh, of what I was about to say, what I'm about to say, when you're a, a mobster, being boring is good. Uh, so the Detroit, the Detroit guys are pretty boring. They, they, exactly. They're not out there killing people. They're not littering the street bodies. They're not on wires, um, gossiping. They're not on social media. So as a, as someone who covers it on the day to day here, uh, I got to really work, <laughs> really, yeah. really pound the pavement for stories. However, like I said, in other cities, and I go to Philadelphia as the as the as the prime example, and all that, there's you know there's stories coming out of the <laughs> woodwork on an everyday basis based on uh, stuff that they're creating. Yeah, you know, they're talking about their night last night and on a Twitter post. Yeah, there's so much going on in Philadelphia. For me, um, it's uh, I've only been kind of following this stuff for a few years, so this is one of the first times where I've got like. Uh, actual new things happening, you know, in real time that I'm following instead of, you know, somebody from the fifties or something like yeah, that. The, but with the George, H's, this week. you know, he's got his show and I love that show when he puts that out and it's just, but it's so different for me because he's dealing with such current issues. I mean, like it's kind of the same thing you do. You're, you're talking about things that are happening today, which is so different mm-hmm. from uh, a West coast guy like me talking about somebody that was alive in the fifties. It's just, you know, there's, there's nobody that's going to come to me or be knocking on my door and say, knock us off. You know, what are you doing? I might get a family member who's a little upset here or there, but you know, nobody that's going to really tell me to stop or, or anything. So, but uh, it's, it's a whole other world. And it's fascinating for me to watch, you know, guys like you who are, are keeping up on current events. I think it's just so much harder to do so much more work. Yeah, The Boston Philly is going on trial next week. So uh, it should be interesting. So we're, we're all watching. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Rolling the dice, man. If I was him, I would uh, take the deal that they're offering him. They're offering him, I think, 40 months or something. He'd be out probably in 30 months. And uh, he's still a pretty young guy. He's only 55. 
Um, but if he gets c- uh, convicted of this, he'll be a third-time loser. If I was Joey Morlino, I, I would uh, take the deal that they're offering and, and uh, I'd be thanking my lucky stars that I could run away with a possible 40-month sentence. He'd probably be out 30 months. He's a relatively young guy. He's only about 55. And if he if he does get convicted of this case, he's a three-time loser. It'll be his third federal conviction. And he's going to have to do, you know, probably over a decade. And that pretty much would, you know, take him off uh, take him off the radar until his late 60s. And uh, that just not, it's not a good look for someone that uh, really relishes the role and, and loves the loves the position, loves the power, loves the, the you know, just someone who really <laughs> cherishes the ability to live life as a criminal. Yeah. Um, he sure. just, he almost gets off on, on the criminality of, of his life. Uh, he loves, he, he, he probably um, lives by the adage, uh, uh, it's a famous quote from, from, uh, um, from a movie, uh, money stolen, money won is 10 times better than money earned. Right. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you're talking whether you steal it or you win it gambling. Um, it's, it just, it, it, there's a, there's a, there's a feeling of satisfaction that certain people get from that. That is yeah. like a, it's like a drug. It's a drug. I, I think you'd have to have a little bit of that to just even to get that high up in that world. If there wasn't a part of you that, that relish, you know, in it, it, you, you couldn't do it. It's just, you know, it, it's gotta be something that's, that's in you. And that's what makes those guys, you know, interesting yep. to people like us who could never put their mind into that mindset. And, Joey's and never left an honest day's, uh, honest day's work in his life. He's never held a normal job. Um, he literally just lives by lying in his pockets, by uh, shakedowns and tributes and and so forth. Um, again, it, could, it couldn't be more uh, polar opposite to Detroit, where wow. most of the leaders of the family are. Uh, I use the term vertically integrated, and uh, you know, have major interest, financial interest, in, in very successful uh, businesses. Where they're able to, you know, co-mingle funds and and not raise red flags for sure. for for the uh, you know the, the eye of the government looking to to nail them on tax evasion. Um, you know, uh, the underboss of the Detroit family recently sold the business for over a hundred million dollars. So that, that's the kind of criminal Jeez. you're dealing with in Detroit, sure. as opposed to in Philadelphia, where, like I said, Joey, <laughs> uh, he's 55 and. Uh, you know, every day is is a life uh, is is like a, it's like the movie Goodfellas for him. You know? Right, playing cards and busting balls and and throwing down money on uh, whether it be blackjack or, or sports gambling and uh, shaking people down. That's that's what he lives for. So Man, yeah, he'll, he'll, he'll be, yeah, if he you know if he uh, actually goes to trial and rolls the dice at trial and and uh, and loses, that'll be the biggest gamble of his life. And uh, for him. It would be a. Um, it, it would be a. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be quite a. Uh, quite a hindrance to, to his lifestyle if he has to. Uh, obviously, if he has to go and, and do another decade behind bars. He just Ooh, did twelve years from two thousand. Yeah, he just did uh, from two thousand uh, from ninety nine to two thousand eleven. He just did twelve years. Wow, man, what a life! But well, uh, Scott, we're just about out of time here, um, so I wanted to. To take these last few minutes to first of all thank you so much for doing this. It's been fascinating. Um, yep. I could have talked to you for quite a quite a while yeah, longer. Um, we'll have to get back after this trial and see kind of we'll talk about what happened a little bit. Um, and then, but before we go, uh, tell us one more time just a little bit about your website and any you know projects you got coming up um, and what you're doing. All right, I have uh, I started a web magazine um, that I try to. Um, akin to kind of a Rolling Stone, like what Rolling Stone is to music, uh, Gangster Report is to uh, the underworld. It's a underworld website that focuses on um, organized crime, but it also uh, touches on politics, pop culture, um, movies, television, music, and uh, tries to find that nexus between all those things. History, current day, um, whether we're talking about historical in the, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, or we're talking about historical in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, as well as breaking news on a day-to-day basis. And I focus on four areas, Detroit, Chicago, and the Midwest, which is really my, 
my bread, my, my bread and butter uh, coverage areas. Cause that's where I'm at. But I also feel like I've been able to make real strong inroads into Philadelphia and New England in the last couple of years using um, uh, reporters that I'm close to. They're feeding me information as well as some underworld guys that I've been able to get in touch with and that that that, that uh, give me some some good intel. And then uh, I you know, try to you know, mix it all in the pot and, and give you give the reader something to really chew on. I would say. There's about, I would say, five articles a week, and they run the gamut from traditional organized crime like the mafia to uh, urban organized crime to biker gangs to the Mexican mafia. Um, I don't try to, I don't want to be pigeonholed as just uh, a site that writes about Italian mobsters, right? Um, because I think that you kind of get into a, uh, you get into a. Um, a box that's kind of hard to get out of it. My articles about biker gangs really gets a lot of traffic. There's a lot of, a lot of biker gangs. Um, There's biker, a big audience. Uh, people that are uh, fishing out of, of the biker gang world that like to read about stuff that's going on in the biker gang world. Right. But it's all fascinating stuff. But uh, I think you do a great job with it. It's, like I said, it's really well done. Um, and there's a lot of content on it, so it's it's amazing how much stuff you're able to put up on there. Uh, Thanks. So yeah, it's it's www, uh, www.gangsterreport.com. And like I said, I, I post about five times a week and, uh, you could, you know, you know, the five articles a week, you know, like I said, uh, it's a, it's a potpourri. You could have a current day mob indictment one day or on, on a Monday. And then on a Wednesday, you were talking about, um, a new movie that came out and, uh, how, you know, uh, that new movie, how it's connected to criminal activity in New York in 1976. And then the next day you could have a, uh, you know, a biker gang, uh, a member of a biker gang just got out of prison and he just got paroled and we talk about that or uh, this guy just died, this, you know, famous drug dealer just died. Uh, that could be an article, stuff like that. So we, we really kind of uh, try to to uh, get a cross-section of a lot of different exciting and interesting pieces of uh, underworld news. Yeah, it's, you're, you do, a, it's, you're successful in what you're trying to do there. It's, uh, I definitely recommend it. And I, anybody who hasn't been there already, Hopefully you'll go and check it out. And so with that, I think uh, we'll wrap it up, Scott. I just want to say once again, thanks so much for doing this. And uh, let's talk again in the future once we find out a little bit what's going on in Philadelphia. We'll get your take on it and uh, we'll do another one. Thanks, Casey. All right. You have a great day, my friend. I'll talk to you soon. All right, buddy. Bye-bye. 